The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government. Hello, my name is Hugh Henry. This is Free Thought Forum. We're going to talk about metaphors in science and religion and every day. When I took chemistry in high school, they opened up by talking about the ancient superstition of the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. And they said, of course, now we know better than that. There are like over a hundred elements and introduced us to the periodic table. But the astronauts, when they returned home from the moon, what did they see? They saw the brown earth of the continents. They saw the air of the edge of the atmosphere and many clouds. They saw the naked fire of the sun. And they saw the water that makes us a uniquely blue planet. These are things that an astronaut, a human being, can feel and understand at a basic level, not over 100 elements of the periodic table. We're here to talk about metaphors, and I have to help me two guests. Lori Dietrich, who is an elder of the Sibylline Order, an international neo-pagan teaching order, with roots in several different Wiccan traditions. She is a writer and ritualist with a particular interest in the psychology of religion. I have Art Severance, who's been a minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Antonio since 1991, and describes himself as a mystical religious humanist. And his church has been a, a, religious, uh, a liberal religious search for people who've been turned off by traditional religion or interested in learning about words, world's religions without creedal requirements. Uh, Reverend Severance was born and raised in New Hampshire, graduated from Ursanus College in Pennsylvania in 72, married and lived in Doylestown, Pennsylvania until 1991. After discovering Unitarian Universalism and wanting to explore religion further, he went to the seminary in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Theological Seminary, graduated in 1987, interned at Princeton Unitarian Church in 1998, and served part-time ministry with small churches until he came to San Antonio in 1991. Now, Wicca uses metaphors of air, earth, fire, and water, as well as the sun and moon and the solar and lunar year. Uh, Christianity uses metaphors that are going to be problematical. For example, the 23rd Psalm says that the Lord is my shepherd, and it says he leadeth me beside still water. I don't think there's very many people who are listening to this program who knows what a shepherd does, let alone that sheep will only drink from stagnant water. A metaphor is supposed to connect what you don't, what you do know, to what you don't know. And if both ends are sitting, hanging up in the air, then you can wind up believing anything you want. Again, Christianity uses metaphors of sowing, reaping, and threshing, and we solve that by going to H-E-B. Now, atheist uses metaphors also. Uh, there's our logic, reason, and science to understand the world. Richard Feynman, the greatest genius of the mid-20th century, one of the greatest, famous for his five easy pieces lecture on physics, says, nobody really understands quantum mechanics, even though he was the author of quantum chromodynamics, uh, which made it sense for everybody else, but not for me, I assure you. He also said, we use mathematics to describe particle physics because we don't really understand it. If we understood it, we could use words. Uh, in the history of science, uh, European magic appears a lot. Uh, Hermes, Trimagistes, astrologies gave us the lawful universe, as opposed to Inshallah, or as God wills it, 
or intelligent design with no laws. Astronomers use an Earth-centered universe to point their instruments. Rocket science uses only Newtonian, not Einstein. And I use the metaphor of a flat Earth to get here, not a curved one. So let's talk first about Wicca. Um, Wicca also uses, as their ceremonial tools, as a tradition, actually tools found in the kitchen. The knife, which is their alfami, the bowl of water, etc. Lori, talk to us about how metaphors make Wicca possible. Well, I would say, first of all, metaphors make all religions possible. That's my particular soapbox. I've been known to say that uh, religion itself is a metaphor for the knowability of the universe. Uh, I think religions work best when they're based on useful metaphors that, as you say, do connect to something that we can understand. Uh, the big ones in Wicca, as you said, the four elements, we use the old, outdated, uh, the, the four elements that everyone laughs at us about. And yet it's a wonderfully elegant system for sort of quartering reality in, in all aspects. Absolutely. And it's applicable to so many hu easy things for humans to understand. Fire. Uh, we use fire as a metaphor for passion, for will, uh, and for the things that drives, for focus. Uh, the tool associated with that, the, the, the symbolic tool of fire is the wand, or the stick, or sometimes, sometimes the blade. That, that depends. The traditions I was trained in use the wand. Because it's a pointing tool. It, it focuses energy. It's, it's something that you can focus your desire on. Water is a metaphor for emotion, for the flowingness of emotion, for, for the watery expression of emotion. It becomes a metaphor for the most basic emotion, for love and for the power of love, that great, patient, sort of yielding power of water that over time will eat away anything. And the cup of water, uh, the cup or the glass of water, again, is a symbol for that which holds water, the metaphor for feeling. Earth becomes the metaphor for so many things. And in an earth-based tradition, earth is the metaphor for the mother, for that which we come from, for that which we owe some sort of filial responsibility to. Uh, it also encompasses all those material things, things you can actually touch, things you, that, you can, that you can feel and collect. Money gets thrown in there, uh, material possessions. The symbol of that generally is the salt, or sometimes the plate or the pattern. Again, as a ground of being. And then finally, air, uh, which becomes the metaphor for the mind, for the activities of the mind. The sort of insubstantial nature of thought, the connectivity of thought, the way air connects everything. And that's become even more true with virtual reality. And Absolutely. You can build anything you want on, on a computer, including yourself as a The introduction of cyberspace has really made air as a metaphor for mentality all, all that much richer. And of course that symbol, that tool, is, is generally the blade and its qualities of discrimination, of cutting one thing from another, the way the mind works when it's working. <laughs> well, also there's the, the solar year, which mm -hmm. until we start living in space um, someday, is something we all experience. We can't escape it. So it's something that, that's easy for us to see. Now, um, there are some uh, Christian metaphors in country Western music which are ugly, but they're clean and they're clear. I mean, drop kick me Jesus through the goalposts of life is not confusing. That's true. <laughs> or I got the hungries for your love and I'm waiting in the welfare line. This is something we can understand. Would you like to talk, would you like to talk about the problem of metaphor and religion and connecting what we know to what we don't know? Sure. I, I, I think that as soon as we start talking about religion, we kind of go into a metaphor. Uh, it's something I call entering the religious dimension. And the religious dimension does not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily based on what you believe. It's more of, a, of an intent to be in uh, religious dimension. Um, so that when folks come to our church 
they may or may not want that. They may be exploring. Um, so when we, we talk, I try to use universal language when we talk about religion. Uh, we are what's known as a non-creedal uh, religion, and that is that um, people are free to develop, develop their own beliefs. And uh, I talk in terms of God or goddess or, you know, what each individual decides uh, that means, so that we have folks in our church that run anywhere from atheist uh, to liberal Christian to Buddhist to Wiccan, uh, etc. Uh, because I, it's a, we're we're a religious umbrella, using another metaphor. That uh, there are a lot of people who come under us, um, and I think what happened is in the the basic start of both Unitarianism and Universalism, which used to be two separate denominations, um, they really started from that idea of metaphor. And the first is the metaphor of Jesus, uh, and the question of if Jesus is Jesus the same as God, is Jesus one of the Trinity? Um, and of course, the Trinity is a metaphor. Uh, but the early Unitarians said that that's that makes Jesus the same as God. And if there's only one God, then Jesus can't also be God. Uh, and so the early Unitarians said the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. The Bible teaches one God and teaches Jesus as the Son of God, if you will but also sometimes says son of man, again using different metaphors. So early on, Jesus was seen as a, as a separate kind of being, um, not the same as God, uh, but not fully human. And then eventually, Unitarianism saw Jesus as being fully human, uh, and the metaphor was uh, the incarnation, but not the literal uh, the belief. In universalism, it was uh, a similar thing about salvation, uh, and that is they went back and they said, you know, the, the term original sin is not a teaching of Jesus. Uh, Christianity never mentions original sin in the New Testament. Um, it's really made up by St. Augustine, uh, you know, a few centuries later. Um, so they too went back to the early New Testament and said, if original sin isn't in there, where did it come from? Why is it there? How could a loving God condemn the elect to hell, uh, to, you know, to heaven? And then the majority of people would, would go to hell. A loving God could not do that, and so the metaphor of a, of a loving God became more important than the judging God. Uh, and universalism started off by saying, everyone will go to heaven. Okay, And so that the metaphor became very different. Um, the old story about the Baptist minister and the universalist minister riding the, the range uh, in New Hampshire. and Okay, here know, we go. <laughs> the Baptist minister was trying to understand universalism. And he finally said, well, I don't understand. If, if there's no hell, what would keep me from knocking you over the head and stealing your horse. And the universalist preacher said, well, if you were a universalist, that never would have appeared to you. In other words, that wasn't a question, are you only good? Because you fear punishment, then, you know, then you're not good. So that idea of the, the metaphor being very important um, and realizing that if indeed we are speaking in metaphors, then what we need to do is to see if we're speaking in similar metaphors rather than saying my metaphor is better than your metaphor. I think you can say my metaphor is better than your metaphor if my metaphor has some relevance in my life and, and yours is based on something even you don't understand um, or know anything about. I think you can say that. Um, I, I understand from elsewhere that um, uh, the creed of a universalist Unitarian is that there is at least one God. Not necessarily. <laughs> we, we sometimes start prayers to, by to whom it may concern. <laughs> because even even God is a metaphor, and so therefore, um, for many people, as I say, we have folks who would, who are atheists um, who would say there is no God. And one of the things I say is my job is to convert all the atheists into becoming agnostics. <laughs> you know that agnostic is is not so sure. You know, the agnostic is exploring. So. Um, I like the. Uh, the Muslim idea has an, have the, have an idea concerning God, and that is that there's no point in trying to figure out who or what he is, because by definition the difference is so enormous that there's no way you possibly could. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything you might say would be wrong and probably blasphemous, so just leave it, forget it, you're not going anywhere with that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, you, you, for them you can love God, you can obey him, but figuring out what he is, just write that one right off. It's pointless, useless. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been using uh, Bart Ehrman's text uh, on the New Testament 
and uh, Airman uh, is it as a um, uh, head of religious studies at North Carolina University, and he describes the Trinity as a political compromise with more political perspiration and very little inspiration mm -hmm. in it, which is why it's a mystery. Yeah. Because they were attempting to rope in all of the folks in the room and get them under one roof, yeah. and the, the concept was never meant to be explored, really, and so it remains a mystery because it was a mystery to the people that put it together. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it goes, it goes back to what I, I said about the, the religious dimension. For people, and, and I was raised in the Protestant church, and I remember saying the Apostles' Creed. Yep. Um, when I went, I went to a Christian, a liberal Christian seminary, uh, and what we found out was that the Apostles didn't write the Apostles' Creed. Nope. <laughs> because the Greek used could not have been used. And I went to seminary with people who were Presbyterian, Congregationalists, not Baptist, because the seminary, <laughs> that's right, it would have been too liberal, okay, uh, but Methodist, Episcopalian, the, the mainline denominations, and we all learned that same fact, okay. But when it came to the preaching class, you couldn't tell that when my Methodist colleague preached, or, you know, when my Presbyterian colleague preached. Um, you know, we don't know who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nope. except that there probably wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who wrote that. And nope. Bart Ehrman is one of those uh, excellent uh, scholars who can be read by people on the conservative and liberal side uh, and respect his scholarship. And I, I think that was a part of it. So that, that very early on, um, the seminary professors welcomed me as a Unitarian Universalist because I would ask the questions that needed to be asked so that they could then explain, you know. Uh, Glad and, you asked that. That's right. <laughs> and one of the things that was that the, the saying... Uh, it's like saying the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, the Apostles' Creed. It becomes a comforting mantra, almost like a Buddhist chant, yep. that puts you into the religious dimension. The difficulty for many of us who are Unitarian Universalists is we were looking at those words and seeing if we agreed with them. Yeah. And we didn't. And so therefore it stopped being comforting and became just the opposite. Well, I went to, as a representative, to the Dallas Conference of Atheists International, American Atheists International, and I don't know how many times I heard the comforting chant of logic, reason, and science, logic, <laughs> reason, and science, with no consideration for the words at all. You know? Well, chanting is a very old, very useful technology. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But as you say, it's difficult when you, when you need to find words that you can agree with. Right. Well, well one thing... I kind of credit um, the coming into existence of Wicca. I think that is actually due to medical, metaphoric, metaphorical failure within Christianity. Mm -hmm. That because we are no longer sheep raisers, farmers, and so forth, um, there was a disconnect for many people in Christianity. And yet they still wanted to reconnect. They wanted a connection to the divine. And they, they weren't getting it. And they weren't getting it because this this other end was just hanging off oh, in space. Yeah, the the obvious one being the whole the way cre traditional Christianity has ignored the feminine. Yeah. There were women who were looking for a metaphor for their divine experience, you know, their experience of the divine and their experience of themselves as partaking of the divine. That absolutely were looking for a goddess figure. Um, interestingly enough, the Wicca is about to start having some of those same problems because, you know, we were born in the f late 40s, early 50s in England. Yeah, it's like your, your time is about right for. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're starting to have some problems, particularly here in this country and particularly but in you Texas. You not burn heretics at the stake, right? No. Okay, just no. <laughs> we just burn but little things representing things we wish to pass out of our lives. Yeah. We're big on burning that. <laughs> but we, we do have a Wheel of the Year, which you and I have talked about before, yeah. that's still largely based on the seasons in northern England. Pretty tough here, especially in South Texas, to be celebrating in September the return of the fall. And leaves are falling off the trees, and it's getting cold and dark. And we're looking around going, you know, no, it's still well, 100 degrees. <laughs> this is a perfect example of what this show is supposed to be about, the problems of metaphor. Yes, and the metaphor <laughs> needs to shift and needs to continue to shift. And there are, there, are some, there are some Wiccan writers and ritualists who are starting to do that, who are talking about the fact that the wheel of the year 
itself is a metaphor, always was a metaphor. The metaphor needs to change and make sense where you are living. If it's about putting yourself in harmony with the seasons and with the things that happen around you, the metaphor needs to change. And that's what, you know, that's what will ultimately, I think, either give this religion some longevity or doom it to just another sort of relic of its time. It's got, the metaphors have to grow. That's the only way the religion can grow. Yeah, you think it's bad now. Wait till you get to Moon and Mars. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, though, the, the incredible popularity of the Da Vinci Code, uh, which, oh, that which piece of brings joke. in so many different metaphors. Uh, and has spawned, and spawn I think is a good term, <laughs> has spawned, you know, so many different books, uh, et cetera. One of Bart Ehrman's books came out right after that, uh, on the lost scripture, et cetera. And uh, uh, they're now, of course, making it into a movie. Um, but it was interesting, just some, some of the balance, uh, and, you know, most Unitarian Universalists preached on it because we enjoyed uh, all of the different metaphors without being threatened by any of them. Um, but it, it was somewhat anti-Catholic. And for those of us who aren't Catholic, that was that was okay. You know? <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I think that that was one of those things where it touched a lot of people, and I think that's one of the reasons why it became uh, so important. And it also deals very much with the feminine in the metaphor of early Christianity, with Mary Magdalene, uh, who, by the way, nowhere in the Bible does it say she was a prostitute. Nope. Um, that's you know something added later on. Mm -hmm. um, but that that she we do know from the the uh, scripture that she was the woman who was at the crucifixion. And of course the Gospels don't agree on who was there, <laughs> except for Mary Magdalene. They all agree on that. So I, th I think that's an example of religious metaphor that people are really uh, hanging on to. And it's popular enough that it must be being read by both conservatives and liberals. Otherwise there wouldn't be that many people reading it. Well, as far as being made into a film, so did Tim LaHaye's Left Behind got made into a film too. Um, getting back to your, your mention of a problem with, with uh, the feminine in Christianity, you've ignored uh, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, who actually makes an appearance every once in a while. Well, <laughs> we would say we never ignored her, but that certain sects of traditional Christianity did. Yeah, but not the Catholics, of course. No, and they got a lot of flack for that. You know, the, the Marianists were not popular for a long time for trying to looking like they were trying to drag the goddess back in through the back door. And, and I think that is different. Growing up Protestant, that feeling of, of Mary as a sacred, not a sacred person, but you know, a good person, uh, that she was a virgin maybe when she gave birth to Jesus, but then she had children. Mm -hmm. And that was a Protestant belief in general that, um, that the Catholics don't agree with. The Catholics didn't, don't think that she had children. She remained a virgin forever. So even whether Jesus had a family depends on which side of the, you know, the, the Christian fence you're on. And how you need to read that metaphor. Right. The metaphor of, of the virginity of <clears throat> Mary is, you know, again, there's a big difference between the people who need to take that as a literal fact, you know, we have the intact hymen versus the spiritual virginity. Well then, of course, there was the fact her mother was a virgin and her mother was a virgin that it ran in the family. <laughs> That's some genetics. Yeah, I uh, never knew that could be genetic. Actually, it was only one, one generation, and they had to do that by uh, papal decree. Okay. Re retroactively right. declared, declared her mother right. Elizabeth, I believe, was Mary's mother. Okay. The Pope has some amazing powers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, another thing that, one of the things you see there is that uh, Mary and then the saints became intercessionaries. And I know that many religions uh, outside of Christianity, for example, Hinduism, have someone you have to go through before you can talk to anybody. So mm -hmm. in Hinduism, you have to speak, to, you have to bring up Ganesha, and, and you know whistle him up and talk to him before you can talk to anybody. Ganesha being the elephant-headed god. And I kind of wonder whether this pagan metaphor was transferred into Christianity to allow for intercessionary gods so that you could talk to someone who wasn't as, as hard to talk to as God. Well, yeah, I think if we see uh, religion as something universal that all people have done throughout history, the, the differences being in their culture, you know, as you said, uh, somebody said theology in India, you know, at 110 degrees is very different than theology at Harvard University in the winter. Okay, 
uh, and your concept of God might depend on how hot it is as well. Um, but that idea that, that really different cultures use the different metaphors. Um, and so we, we see that as many of the universal things that you can see in uh, things like using the metaphor for the, for the different saints, um, Greek and Roman mythology, and mythology means somebody else's religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? um, <laughs> somebody else's metaphor. That's right. Have all those gods and goddesses. And then if you study the saints, you see amazing similarities between the old you know, realm of the gods and goddesses and, and the saints. Uh, and then Catholics left, or Protestants left that behind. So, you know, we, most Protestants see that idea of intercessory prayer as, as almost uh, paganistic. Oh, yeah. In other words, you go directly to God. You don't need a middle person. Well, they consider Christmas, the good, 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 hard-nosed Protestants consider Christmas to be a pagan festival. Sure. Uh, because sure. it wasn't celebrated anywhere in the Old or New Testament. And all of its traditions, and I covered this in another program, all of its traditions come from from Roman paganism and so forth. Uh, the, getting back to, to the problem of, of metaphor, people don't realize that, uh, and I'm not being extreme in this, I don't think, uh, there's hardly anything we do uh, to understand something that doesn't involve metaphor. You have to, you have to rebuild the thing so you can understand it. Um, a schematic draw drawing of an electronic circuit is a metaphor. It's not the circuit. Right. Uh, almost a a there's there's so much of this stuff, uh, so that it's it's not just in religion or in poetry that you see metaphor. Uh, it's the human experience to use it to understand, and it's the way we understand, mm -hmm. and it's the route in. But as I've tried to emphasize, it's so very important that if you're trying to understand something, at least one end of it, you've got a handle on. Mm -hmm. uh, Otherwise, it's not a way in. The only thing that Christians would generally know about what a shepherd does, uh, they're, they're educated on, comes from, of all things, the movie The Silence of the Lambs in the title scene where it talks about what shepherds do with lambs when they're born. And they would never connect that with, you know, their, their Jesus with the lamb under his, his arm and the sheep all around him. Nor would they ever ask, what is it that a, a shepherd eats? What is, what is that shepherd's supper going to be that night? This is something that, the, the place that I think Christianity is most successful is in those places that do raise animals. The Bible Belt <coughs> is a belt of ranching, not by coincidence. Interesting. That is. I've never thought of it that yeah, way. Yeah, I think that for, uh, certainly for Unitarian Universalists, uh, we, we hesitate to use the metaphor sheep for the congregation. Um, and uh, so for us, the idea of a shepherd and sheep is a negative connotation. Uh, not Especially when it comes one. to lamb dishes. <laughs> one would think, yes, yes. Well, um, I'd like to conclude this. I opened with the four ancient elements, earth, air, fire, and water. At present, we have four fundamental uh, forces, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak atomic forces. But string theory may replace these concepts altogether, and centuries from now, we may be thought naive for believing in them. Old metaphors are dead. Long live the new metaphor. This is Hugh Henry for Free Thought Forum. This is an uncertain world, but thank you and come back again. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to Duke or dictator. No person can deny. Dig a dog.